forward. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. Uh, we are going to be talking tonight about perennial tree fruit cultivation and care. Uh, this is the third class we've done this year on perennial fruit. Um, so we, we realized that like, there's just so much information if we're talking about all the small fruits and all the details of how to prune trees and the, and then just like the kind of ins and outs of growing tree fruit. So we broke it out. So the first class we had a few weeks back was small fruit production and care. And then we had a pruning class, uh, tree fruit, tree pruning. And, uh, today we're talking about trees. Um, cultivation and care. So I'll be referencing some of that other stuff, but we're not going to get too deep into any of the other fruit. So today uh, we're primarily focusing on the trees. Um, we can, and hopefully there will be some time at the end and we can talk in detail about um, any questions that you may ha might have on, about any fruit. Um, also would say, uh, I saw there were some questions about about uh, elderberry and elderberry care when maybe we'll um, hold those off and come come full circle on those you know questions about pruning and such uh when we get to that section sound good okay so again if you could please uh direct any questions to the chat jess is going to keep me on uh in uh in the loop on what's going on in the chat and i'm going to dive into the presentation here Okay, so here's a fun old picture of, of uh, all the different types of fruits that are grown here in Michigan. Um, so we can grow a lot of stuff. Um, uh, so kind of a general overview of what we're gonna be talking about today is uh, what grows well in our region and what we cannot grow very well in our region based on the climate here um, and considerations for what types of plants we might wanna grow, um, the considerations for um, where to plant the stuff, uh, sun and soil requirements um, and uh, size considerations, um, how long it takes some things to fruit, how long they live, um, we'll get, you know, we'll talk a bit about um, how to plant these th things, uh, things, ongoing care, and then finally pest control. And we'll get into some other things too. There's a lot, there's a lot of information here. So, so um, first off is just baseline. Um, why are you going to grow fruit at home? Excuse me. Um, there's, you know, very simply, you know, gives, gives options of more unique varieties you can explore. Like in apples alone, there's like hundreds of varieties of apples and lots of unique ones. Um, you know, I'm following this guy on Instagram that uh, takes all these amazing pictures of all these different apple varieties, very beautiful pictures. And that's really fun. Um, his name's Poem Queen, if you're ever, if you're interested in checking it out, P-O-M-E, Poem Queen. Um, but like just, you know, that alone there, there are, and also with, um, uh, there's different types of peaches, there's different types of cherries, like there's just lots to explore. And there's lots of unusual varieties too, that aren't are kind of outside the standard peach, pear, um, plum, apple, uh, there's, you know, there's some of the more kind of off the beaten path fruit that we'll talk a little bit too, that, that can grow well here. For example, pawpaws is one. Um, you know what you're getting when you plant stuff at home um, in terms of like how it was cared for, uh, any, you know, if there was any, any kind of spray schedule and just like, you know, just like in our, our home gardens, um, you know, tree, uh, ripe fruit right off of the tree is uh, pretty darn delicious, um, tends to be really nice quality. Um, it does take work, you know, uh, gardening and farming in general is a labor of love. So there are um, some things that you need to consider in terms of, of labor. I mean, tree, you know, trees, 
aren't like a every week thing. And, you know, after they get to a certain size, watering is less of the concern. They can, you know, do a lot of survival on, on, on most of the water that nature provides. Um, but uh, there are things that you need to do every year uh, to care and keep them up. And uh, pest problems are, are, you know, are something to consider. Um, and, you know, sometimes you might end up with imperfect fruit um, because pest management is tricky. And we'll try and get into that more towards the end. Um, and just as a general comparison, um, if you're thinking about, you know, especially if you're setting up a new site and you're, uh, you're starting a new garden space and you're trying to think about what you want to plant there, um, you know, in terms of perennials, uh, the things that are tend to be, are the smaller fruits, strawberries, raspberries, blackberries, grapes, things of that sort. Um, they're, they're smaller, their plants are smaller in it, you know, as well as the fruit, of course. Um, so they take up less, you know, generally less space depending on, on which, which it is. Um, but, uh, they also generally tend to, um, come into fruit much quicker. Um, a lot of the tree fruits take at least three or four years before you're starting to get any kind of production of, of like, I don't know, any kind of volume of fruit. Um, whereas something like strawberries or raspberries or blackberries, you're getting fruit in the second, by the second year. Um, and like I had mentioned earlier, uh, you know, pest management is definitely a concern for tree fruit management and tree fruit and um, just something that you're gonna have to deal with. Oh, heck. Ooh, there. Um, here is, you know, my kind of anecdotal experience with fruit that performs the best in our area. Um, these are the things that, you know, I have had personal experience with or um, know gardeners and growers who have good success with them. Um, so, um, you know, all of the small fruits, uh, including some of the things that are going to uh, you know, gooseberries in Saskatoon, some of the kind of more unusual stuff go really well. Um, pawpaws, we'll talk a little bit more about those later, but they, I have some in my yard, they're doing great. Um, uh, cherries are doing, cherries really do really good. Peaches do really good. Um, apples and pears, you know, it's a little bit of hit and miss. I mean, there's definitely and, you know, and something, a lot of that has to do with the site and the soil. Um, there's a lot of those considerations um, because I know like you'll see trees that are completely uncared for around the, around the city. Apple trees for, you know, is a great example. I, I know of several trees that are basically on, on a corner lot that nobody's taking care of or by my kid's school up the street, there's a tree that nobody's done anything with. And they're la la laden down with fruit every year, um, and so um, that you know that's a sign that like they can thrive here. Uh, it's just a kind of a setting them up for for success is is what you want to do, and we'll talk a little bit more about that as we go along here. Um, some of the things that people are are excited about that um, that I would just uh, say if you are super excited, you know, enter with you know, a spirit of adventure and that you may succeed and you may fail, um, that like, uh, and that would include plums, apricots, hardy kiwis and hardy figs. If you're not familiar with hardy kiwis, they're similar to the kiwis that we know, you know, we are, uh, that we get, you know, typically from, uh, the grocery store, but they're not fuzzy on the outside. They're actually smooth on the outside and slightly smaller. Um, they're super fun, and uh, but uh, my understanding, you know, for kiwis themselves, they take um, they they can just have very inconsistent, you know, fruiting. So one year you'll get fruit, and then it might be another two or three years before you get fruit again. Um, and we'll talk about some reasons why that might happen um, related to frost, um, and then plums and apricots. So. Um, the both of those and plums are another one and both of these are, are actually um, ones that I've seen around the city and people and some people have trees that have been, you know, in their gardens in their yards for many years and they're doing good. Um, but, you know, we were with uh, with Keep Growing Detroit's perennial fruit sale for many years. 
um, we would sell those, uh, sell plums particularly. We, we, we kind of avoided apricots because they're, they're, um, you know, they're prone to early uh, frost and, and loss of blossoms. So we just kind of, we're trying to pick things that were the most successful, but plums themselves, I was talking with a, a local extension agent and I was like, you know, I just, we've been selling these plants and I got, you know, I, I've had personal experience with them and, and, and people have come to me complaining, saying they just never really, they'll, they'll have a beautiful bloom, you know, be full of blooms in the spring and they'll start to set fruit and then you know, basically no harvest at the end, they'll drop all the fruit or they just never kind of come through. And his response was, you know, even the growers that I know the best, like that are, that's all they do is they have these fruit orchards um, and they have some plums in their yards. They get fruit maybe every five or six years, they'll get a flush of fruit and then it's, then they have off years. So I just generally for that reason, um, don't recommend them. If you have the space and, um, then, you know, and you want to experiment, by all means, try it. Um, uh, and they, you know, and maybe you could have some, some degree of success, um, you know, with that caveat of it's going to maybe be fruiting every four or five years. Um, so, and then, uh, and then finally, you know, any things like citrus, you know, lemons, even people who talk about, you know, I'm going to grow a lemon tree in my greenhouse. Um, you know, it's a real uphill battle to try and do, you know, citrus are definitely do not tolerate frost. So, you know, and, and all, all these other, you know, fruits that are related to, you know, or tropical um, type fruits uh, will not, uh, will not grow very well in our, uh, in our region, will not grow, you know, will not thrive in our region. And maybe you could grow, you know, a small lemon tree and get a couple lemons off of it, but um, it's going to be, you know, a, a lot, a lot of work just to get to that point. Uh, Cheryl, can you drop your question in the chat, or do you? Uh, you have a question in there. Uh, what are Saskatoons? Saskatoons, yes. Um, Saskatoons, also known as service berries um, or June berries, uh, they're a they're a small berry that looks very similar to a blueberry. They grow on a tree instead of a shrub. Um, well, they, there are like kind of bush forms of them as well. Uh, and they, um, uh, they, have, they have a mild almond flavor um, with a little bit of sweetness. Um, uh, really good. Uh, and they really, they're really, really popular in Canada in certain regions of Canada. Um, so something, um, that I've had, you know, and the, there are varieties of them that are really beautiful street trees or, or ornamental trees. So yeah, that's a Saskatoon. Um, okay. Any other questions? Um, someone, uh, wants a hardy kiwi tree. Where could they probably find some of the maybe fruits? Okay. Uh, we'll talk about sources a little bit more towards the end, so we can just hold off till then. We'll we'll get into that. I definitely can talk about sources towards the end. Okay, uh, so let's take a minute and um, just reflect on uh, winter hardiness. So, uh, in Michigan, um, if you're not familiar, you know basically there is a national kind of hardy. Uh, code for hardiness um, using um, numbers zero to, I don't know how high it goes, maybe eight or nine. But basically the lower the number um, means that's a region that gets, uh, has um, an average of below, you know, like in this case, uh, the yellow 3B, um, they have consistent winters with minus 30 degrees, 30, 30 to 35 degree weather. Um, and uh, some plants really can't tolerate that deep of a cold. Um, but most of our most of the things that we're talking about um, can tolerate, you know, some degree of cold. Of course, we're trying to grow them in Michigan, and we know that it gets cold here. Um, our uh, our zone in 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 Detroit, in our region here, uh, Southeast Michigan, is you know six A, six B. 
um, there's some pockets of 5B, um, but if you're, when you're looking for, you know, when you're looking at fruit catalogs or if you're looking at online and trying to purchase fruit, always pay attention to the hardiness and make sure that it's um, not above 6B. So if it's a seven or an eight, that means it does not, it needs to be grow, grown in like more Southern climates. Um, and it will probably struggle to survive our winters. So that's like a, an example of that would be like the hardy fig. So, you know, there are figs that are, you know, figs are, I think, I don't know exactly, but I think, you know, they're very popular in the Mediterranean. Um, so they're, yeah, and, and there's been some cultivation of them um, to be able to grow them in Northern climates like here in Michigan but they need a lot of protection and they need a buffer from these deep freezes, uh, these deep freezing temperatures. And so what, you know, and because a fig is something somewhat, somewhere between a, a woody and uh, an herbaceous perennial or it die, essentially it can die back to the ground each year, um, then it can, you know, and it can send up new growth. Um, you can make it worth work, but you just need to give it some protection. Um, with, you know, bagged leaves and packed around the stems and things of that sort. Um, another kind of marker of, of cold and, and another kind of marker and identifier that we should be aware of, of particularly related to apples or, or um, so a lot of the trees is frost free days. Um, so, you know, these plants need a certain number of days um, to be able to come out of dormancy, you know, open the bud to open, leaf out, flower, flower develops into the fruit, fruit comes to full maturity. So, you know, in this in this column to the far right, um, a, a Macintosh uh, needs 146 frost-free days. Um, and a Fuji needs 183. And our average here is in Detroit is somewhere in the neighborhood of 164. So Fuji may not be a good choice um, for that reason because we don't have enough frost-free days here generally. Whereas, um, you know, Benton Harbor or, you know, a little south to the west of us has a few more days, not quite as many for that Fuji. My cat's meowing here in the background. Um, okay. And then just to review what I, I was just mentioning, um, just a little bit of review plant science here is basically um, the flower buds for what is gonna be the fruit uh, will develop this year. So towards the end of this year, the flower buds will start to develop for what is going to be the fruit for next year. And so if those buds are damaged during the winter months, then we don't get a good fruit. So like, you know, you may have heard on, in some years when we have a really late frost or we get that weird, you know, that un, kind of, well, we get that April snow and uh, some deep cold, um, if you know some of these things, if their if their tendency is to uh, to open up to to bud out and start to flower before that frost happens, um, then those buds could be frozen and and die off, and you lost your fruit crop for that year. Doesn't kill the tree; it's just killing the what is the potential for the fruit. Um, there are some fruits that have uh, this, you know, their buds are protected by the soil. Strawberries is an example. Um, and, you know, if it, it, it's always our concern is if, if there was a, you know, if there was a snap frost and you are wondering if they're going to make it, if they haven't leafed out yet, you might take a look and uh, um, see what those buds look like, if they look like they're damaged or not. And that'll give you a sense of if, if it's gonna 
the fruit is going to actually come through for you. Um, another, you know, I, I guess I'll, I'll repeat what I said at the beginning of the class that we will be sharing, um, that we are recording today and we will be sharing the slides. So some of these things I'm gonna go through kind of quickly and you'll have those slides for, for reference for the future. Um, so just this is another, um, you know, reference for, you know, what to know about some of these fruits and it, what, what kind of tolerance they have for really cold temperatures um, uh, during the winter. Um, you know, all these things, you know, if, if you look back at that, uh, this hardiness zone, again, if we are six, if we're six A or six B, we generally don't drop too far below minus five or minus 10 during the winter. So all of these things are going to be just fine under those circumstances. Um, so this is uh, another concern is at what point do, uh, do these fruits bloom and that is another you know like kind of how i was referencing about those late winter or early spring frost like if we get a, a, a deep frost in april or a heavy snow um, these are the ones you know up and to the left are the things that tend to bloom pretty early and would be at more at risk and the things to the low you know, as it cascades down and lower to the right these are the things that are uh, tend to bloom a little bit later in the season and might, you know, have the benefit of, of missing any kind of late early spring frosts. Um, and, and so you can see apricots and plums are, are the first couple here that tend to bloom pretty early. Um, and that probably factors into why, um, you know, there's inconsistent fruiting or you might not get fruit on those types of trees in Michigan um, every year and more like, you know, it might be in some cases up to five or six years um, be, before you get a, a good solid fruit. Okay. So now we're going to get into like figuring out um, what is a good site, what is the best situation to set your plants up for success. Um, it's always a good idea to, um, you know, kind of map out where you're going to, you're going to plant things, you know, and in, in just, I, I guess, another way to think about it is, you know, we're, if we're working in our vegetable gardens, we can, we do rotation and we can, things are annual. They, they live one season, excuse me, and they, they die back to the ground and we can switch things up every year. Whereas, you know, maybe stating the obvious, but these things are perennial. They're going to be there year after year, uh, you know, and uh, in some cases, some of the smaller fruits, you could move around if you needed to, you could transplant them, but any of the fruit trees after a couple of years, you really need to, you know, they, if you try to disturb their soil to move them, you know, you're risking losing the tree altogether. Uh, but uh, all that said, you want to make sure with, with most of these, most, and these are generalizations here um, for most of the fruit, uh, is that uh, they have most all of them need really full sunlight all day. Um, so if there are, is there, if there's shade from adjacent buildings, or if they're um, backed up into an area where there's tree cover or shade tree cover, um, that could be problematic and stunt their growth. And they may kind of hang on and survive, but they, you know, they may not do very well to, for actual fruit production. Um, for soil requirements, it's saying sandy loam to clay loam. Um, that's a fancy way of saying, um, you know, decent soil that's easy to work with. Um, so if you're dealing with situation where your uh, soil is not the greatest, um, you know, considering some kind of amendment uh, to the area um, and, and kind of the, uh, uh, the soil itself uh, for the needs of the plants might be a good idea. The best way to know that the quality of your soil is to do a soil test. We're going to talk a little bit more about that um, in a minute. Um, pH that most of the, these fruits like is uh, six 
point two uh, to seven point five, and you know, uh, just based on anecdotal knowledge of seeing lots of soil tests over the years um, through that have for, from folks who have come through the garden resource program, I can tell you that most Detroit soils are at you know seven point uh, or above on the pH scale. Um, and a note that uh, blueberries in particular, because you know, I know a lot of people are excited about growing blueberries, blueberries really like acidic soils and they are not gonna do very well in our very basic soils. They like their pH to be closer to 4.5 to five. And you know, like I said, uh, we have really basic soils. So um, I would not recommend trying to grow blueberries in our soil. You might be able to keep them alive, but getting them the fruit after you know more than one season is not going to be very easy. Um, so uh, the other thing to consider is what is the mature size of these plants. Um, so the is an example like if you ordered a fruit tree through uh, our perennial fruit sale, those trees are going to come and it looks it's going to look like a four foot long stick with some roots on the bottom of it. And it doesn't look like much. And it's about, a you know, three quarters of an inch in diameter. Um, it just mostly looks like a twig when you get it. But on, at mature size, they will be up to 15 feet in diameter. And, you know, 10 to 12, at least 10 to 12 feet in height. So those, they, they take up space. And so, um, you know, when you, there is, you know, when if you're part of the, the sale, we will share some directions and some recommendations for specific planting for each. Uh, as a general rule, perennial you know, for the fruit trees themselves is uh, is around about 15 feet apart, um, and uh, and then some of the other smaller things, you know, um, we would give you uh, specific spacing recommendations. Um, but you can always simply Google, uh, you know. Uh, apple tree spacing or uh, elderberry tree spacing, you know, and so on and so forth. Um, I do want to note that um, the city of Detroit is really starting to crack down on um, on guidelines that they have set forth in with planning development. So there are certain set setback requirements for an orchard or for fruit tree plantings. Um, so trees cannot be any closer than 15 feet uh, from the sidewalk. So you have to, you can't be right up on the sidewalk with a fruit tree. You can't be in the easement with a fruit tree. Um, I wouldn't recommend that either because salt damage is going to be a problem. Um, and, and then you should, and then technically you should also be 15 feet from uh, a neighboring property. So it's a little bit tricky because the way that the wording is like, say you are on a vacant lot between two houses and most vacant city lots are 30 feet wide. So that means you could only plant in the middle. Um, you know, I think there's maybe some wiggle room around that, but um, you know, we are, we're trying to be in good standing with the city and, and trying to help people because they are starting to come through and, and review what people have done. And if you're submitting any kind of site plan for ownership. So, so you know, if you want to avoid any kind of problems or getting a ticket from the city, um, you, know, you know, there are some recommendations for, for those things. Um, and uh, I, I, I have some resources on that that I did not include in this presentation, but if you're really interested in those setbacks and stuff other than what I've shared today, um, please reach out to me. I have a question. Um, if they planted their pear tree last year, is it safe for them to move it to an, another location? Yeah, you know, uh, it's not it's it's not ideal. This you know, once it's you're setting it back a little bit, but you know, if it's only a year old, it's probably not a, that big of a deal um, to transplant it. Uh, I would say, you know, have a big. Uh, if you can have a big pot or some container and try and keep um, whatever root, uh, whatever, I'm sorry, whatever soil uh, that is around the roots, uh, try and keep all that intact as much as possible. Because like when you get those trees, they're bare rooted, but once they're planted, they're going to start to 
send out like smaller hair roots and like start to get themselves established. So we want to try and minimize disturbing that as much as possible. But uh, you could probably relatively easily kind of dig loose and wide and, and get a sense of where the root ball is. And it's not, it's not a, not a bad thing. It won't, it's pretty reasonable to do. Um, um, go ahead. One last question. Is it wise to plant trees in an enclosed garden? Enclosed garden. Uh, more, what do you, what do you mean by enclosed garden? Uh, that was Angela. Yes, hi. Can you hear me? Hey, Angela. Hi, how are you? How, Good. How's everyone? Um, yeah, I have a problem. I have a problem with um, possum and deer. And so my plan was to enclose my, I'm going to put a uh, wire around my garden. I have uh -huh. a full lot, but I don't feel comfortable with it exposed. I don't want it open. Sure. Um, and so, and I'm right, I'm, I have the whole lot, but I'm on, off the alley. I'm on the dead end of my block. Right. I want to build an enclosement, an encasement around the garden. Um, I'm, I, my plan was to put the trees in each corner, but listening to you, that doesn't sound like that's a good idea. So um, I'm open for any input. Yeah. Um. Well, I mean, you need to give the, tr the tree room to grow. And like I had mentioned, ultimately they're gonna get roughly 15 feet in diameter. So you need to be able to accommodate that. Uh, I would say possums are probably gonna, not gonna give you much problem uh, for, for fruit. Uh, deer might, um, but might not. And I'm, I would just recommend I mean, either you fence in the entire lot, which might be a slightly, though, you know, that's an investment, uh, but that might be slightly more practical than trying to enclose each of kind of the trees or whatever. Um, uh, you know, or you just try it and see what happens, um, you know, because if you don't have trees there yet, then you don't necessarily know that the the deer are going to pose problems. So, you know, I would say maybe give it a shot and then um, instead, and because I, I just don't know how you're going to enclose, you know, around a fruit tree very successfully and still be able to manage it and, and all that kind of thing. So that's my two cents. Hopefully that's helpful. Do you, is that, is that okay, Angela? Okay, if there's more questions, we'll, we'll get to it. Um, we'll, sorry about that. I'm sorry about that. I was typing another question. I didn't want to interrupt, but um, that I hear that. And I'm still, again, my biggest issue is the, the dogs, the cats, the, the squirrels. The <laughs> uh -huh. I'm really, I really have concerns and I'm, and, and I'm new to this. Right. Uh, last year, I didn't have uh, the squirrel. He went to the top and he just sat there and looked down. He didn't get in the garden. Because right. I did have a small enclosed garden. Yeah. He just sat, he just was sit on the top. The squirrel. Yeah. And the birds would also do the same thing, but the, nothing could get in. So I'm right. really just concerned. I've seen a lot of gardens in my neighborhood, and they're all open. But again, yeah. I'm, if you look at the picture behind me, I'm in an area that's really wooded. I'm right, right. down at the yeah. tracks. And so there are a lot, right. lot of animals <laughs> roaming around. Yeah. I mean, I don't know, like, that's nature, you know? I don't know if there's a whole lot you can do aside from fencing, fencing in the whole garden. That's not going to keep the squirrels out. Like, feral cats, squirrels, they're going to, they're going to, you, you're, you know, and you don't even know that they're going to be a problem yet. They're going to do their thing and maybe walk through your yard. Like um, you can't kind of, I guess the short of it is that you can't keep nature out and uh, you're, or, you, or you can only do so much to keep nature out. Um, I, I think I would just encourage you to just give it a shot and see what like, you know, I know you're kind of building up the garden and, you know, try one thing at a time and see how they react and, and all that kind of thing. And 
And and I think that might help you figure it out over time. You know, guard there's so there's a lot to be said for just trying things and see what happens. Um, and instead of uh, expecting the worst to happen and, and trying to deal with it ahead of time. I mean, I appreciate what you're saying about just trying to be prepared and, and be preventative. Like that's a valuable, that's a foresight and that kind of thing is like, is really actually super valuable um, in working in the garden and, and like management. Cause like sometimes you gotta know what scenario, what you're gonna do in a certain scenario. But in this circumstance, I would, I would just say, um, you know, give it a shot and, and see it, see what happens. Okay, thank you. Um, moving on. So we got, um, okay, we, I just like lingered on this slide for a second, but just to say, you know, some of the, some, if you're dealing with poor soil, there are some plants that just don't tolerate very well and some that handle a little bit better. So that's what we're talking about here, where peaches and nectarines and apricots are more sensitive and apples and pears are, are much more tolerant of, of not great soils. But we're trying to, in general, we're really just trying to create a best case scenario when we're planting these things. So we'll talk about how to prepare the soil a little bit more as we go along here and amending the soil and things of that sort. You know, we do have some soil questions, so I guess uh, I'll let you get through it first. Okay, well, let's, uh, yeah, we're gonna talk a little bit more about soil and fertility in a minute. So maybe we'll hold off on those. Um, if there is a situation, so uh, other kind of considerations is uh, you don't want, if you know you have a low lying area in your garden um, that tends to get like standing water in the spring or during the winter months, it's not a good idea to plant things there if you can help it. Um, but if that if it's the only option or is the best option under the under your circumstances, then um, planting, you know, creating a berm um, and kind of building up the soil to be above that water table uh, could be a good uh, a good compromise where you're digging out the soil. Um, and then bringing in some uh, compost and soil to mix together, you know, digging out a hole for the plant, I'm sorry, and then uh, bringing in some compost and then, you know, basically building the soil to be a berm up above the, you know, roughly six inches above the soil. And you can see in this situation where the root mass is kind of above, uh, above the, the, the line of the soil there. Um, so, uh, in terms of choosing fruit types, varieties, and rootstocks, so there's, um, there's types of fruit. Types of fruit would be apple, peach, pear. Varieties would be a Gala apple or a Granny Smith apple. Um, and then the rootstock, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute, but the rootstock, um, determines how big the tree will get. So there are dwarf root stocks, there are semi-dwarf root stocks, there are stand, what is, would be standard, which means, you know, um, uh, it just means they're bigger, they're just bigger than dwarf and semi-dwarf, it's the biggest one. Um, uh, so um, we'll talk a little bit more about root stocks a little bit later too. Uh, Always look at the growing zones. We talked about that. Uh, so we want to know that it's a 6A or a 6B or lower. Um, check for the frost-free day requirements. Um, and then, uh, you know, other considerations would be if you want to have continuous fruit in the garden, um, look for things that are tend to ripen early and middle and late. So like, for example, a lot of the tree fruit, once they start to come into bearing, um, tend to uh, be mature more later in the season, uh, July, August, you know, July earliest, but uh, August, September into, into the, you know, uh, into late in the season. Um, and then some of the, and then the smaller fruits uh, like strawberries, um, June berries, they are bare in June, you know, strawberries, June berries, uh, uh, raspberries, um, 
will tend to be on the earlier side of the season. And then there's some varieties of raspberries that actually will, will fruit twice. They're ever bearing. Um, uh, so there, you know, some considerations there. Okay. Now we're, we should talk, this is uh, specifically talking about tree fruit um, for the most part. Uh, so I guess if you're growing any kind of fruit, um, you should ask the question to yourself, does it need a, a pollinator partner? Um, so what that means is um, some types of fruit trees need another type. So like uh, in this, the scenario here on the sheet, uh, the, there's a red delicious um, needs a golden or, or another type of apple tree, a red delicious apple uh, needs another type of apple tree of a different variety to cross pollinate. Um, so in this case, there's a red delicious and a golden delicious. Um, some there it's, it's slightly confusing because there are some in this case, apple varieties that are technically self-pollinating, but they will always do better if they have a cross-pollinator. So I guess to generalize, apples and pears always need a second tree of a different variety to cross-pollinate. Um, so uh, and we'll, uh, we'll do, do some referencing here on, on how to figure that out in a second. But always, you know, and you need to identify, is this tree self-fruitful where it, it can pollinate just in, with one tree or do you need at least two trees? If it's self-unfruitful or, um, uh, or not self-pollinizing, um, even having more than two, three, four, five, six, eight, ten, more trees you have, the more you know, possibility of having those insects come and pollinate, crawl, go to one flower and then go to another um, to have a good pollination um, for a successful fruiting. Um, so some examples here of self fruitful plants would be peaches. Uh, there are some, the tart cherries, there are some sweet cherries like this, the sweet cherry that we, we sold with the uh, the Keep Growing Detroit fruit sale this year is a self-pollinating sweet cherry. Grapes are self-pollinating, raspberries, strawberries. Um, and then not things that need a cross-pollinator, again, to review, are uh, apples, pears, mo you know, parentheses, most sweet cherries, even though there are some self-pollinating. Um, and so we need insects to, to do that job. Um, so that's uh, another reason to have uh, lots of flowers in, in our gardens. Uh, so we wanna have early blooming things that will kind of bring a, a buffet of, of plants that these, plant, that these uh, pollinators will come into town for and then land on your fruit and help you with your pollination. Um, uh, but it's just important to know you can't just plant one apple tree or plant one pear tree um, and have any degree of, of fruiting success. Uh, so we're, you know, and so you got to figure that out. Um, and so oftentimes when you're looking, uh, the nurseries, or you can look up, you, you know, again, you can use that beautiful Google and, uh, and just say, what is a good pollinator for, you know, um, gala apples and there's in there usually or or look for apple pollinating chart and this and then you can cross reference what what would be good cross pollinators so um just to to review uh how this little chart works here uh if we're looking at um stanley for instance on the left hand column stanley uh plums are um do really well with uh, as a good pollinizer for Italian plums, right? And uh, whereas, uh, and that, you know, they, they do kind of okay if you, you have two Stanley trees, but you really want a different variety. Uh, and then, you know, uh, so there's, uh, there's charts for these for, 
for pears and apples as well. This is uh, plums that we're, we see in this example here. Okay, so now we're gonna start to get, uh, start to familiarize ourselves a little bit with the trees themselves and what to know about them um, to keep them healthy and happy. Um, so just about all fruit trees that we get and we grow are, are, um, are grafted. So basically there is a root stock that uh, there's like in this situation, you can see uh, below this line here, uh, there is, you can see this kind of where the thickness of the trunk goes from wider to thinner. So early in this plant's life, uh, they basically, they took that root stock, they cut it off, they cut the top off of it, and then they, uh, they uh, grafted another branch from what's called the scion, uh, from, so whatever it is, the guy, uh, in this case, maybe this is a gala apple, okay? So it's a M111 rootstock. Uh, the rootstocks have really exciting names like um, M111. <laughs> And uh, and then it's the and which determines the size and the uh, robustness of the tree, and then the scion determines the type of fruit that it is. So generally speaking, the uh, the rootstocks are going to dictate not only the size is it dwarf, semi dwarf, or standard, but also um, they also have some indicators for um, disease tolerance. Uh, and um, other, and, and, and on some level, um, uh, tolerance of poor soils. Um, so uh, we always try and choose ones that'll work in, in a diverse amount of, you know, diverse variety of situations when we're, you know, trying to choose things for the perennial fruit sale. Um, so that's uh, the rootstock graft union and the scion. And it, one really important thing for us to know about that is when we are planting these trees, hold on, let's see, I wanna show you a picture. Oh boy, it's gonna take a minute to get there. Oh, what, where's that picture? Okay, so when we're planting a fruit tree, um, this is kind of what it's gonna look like. And we always, always, always want the graft union to be above the ground, okay? So, um, and we'll get, we'll talk, I guess we'll get into that a little bit more as I'm getting a little bit ahead of myself here. Um, uh, While you're doing that, you have a couple questions. Um, I yeah. think you answered this one, but will bees make up for the lack of cross-pollinating trees? Say, say that one more time. Will bees make up for the lack of cross-pollinating trees? Mm -hmm. We want bees to help with that work. Yeah, whether it be honeybees or, you know, some of the native bees that are in our region. Um, so there are a few other pollinators that would help, you know, help with trees. Uh, uh, but you still have to have that pairing. You still have to have those two different they need to be relatively close together is the other part of that. So, you know, if Jessica lives on the west side and she's got an apple tree and I got an apple tree in my yard, like we can't, you know, the bees aren't going to, even though the bees will fly two miles to, to a pollen source, it's not going to work out really well for cross pollination. So you really want those trees to be within, you know, 50 feet of each other to have any kind of decent pollination. Uh, opportunity for that bee to visit the flower on this tree and then visit a flower on this tree. Um, kind of lead that, to the next question is how, how close do apple trees uh, need to be to each other in order for the cross pollination to work? Yeah, like I said, I mean, no closer than 15 feet, I would say no further than like 30 or 40 feet away. Okay, uh, here's some terminology um, just to you know familiarize yourself with the tree a little bit. So we talked about the graft union at the bottom, and that's where the scion connects to the rootstock. 
there's the branches that, and you know, this is kind of digging into things, some things related to uh, pruning, but the branches are what are the framework or the scaffold. Um, there will be, uh, you know, you'll get sprout water shoots will, uh, are, are something that happens every year. Um, spurs are the, what will be ultimately bud out to be the leaves and the flowers, ultimately the fruit. Um, and la you know, that, I think that's what I want to cover on this slide right now. So, okay, moving on. How, uh, how long do you get fruit on trees and how long do these trees live? Um, so uh, just another reference here, peaches, for example, only really expect to live around 12 years, which is if they take up to five years to start fruiting is a little bit disappointing, but man, peaches are so good, especially peaches fresh off the tree. Um, but uh, here's a reference chart for that. Tart cherries will la you know, live much longer, 20 plus years. And then apples and pears, you know, they, they last, you know, they're, they're legacy plants. Those are plants that, um, uh, that will, uh, you know, live for many, many years. Sourcing. So this kind of comes full circle on that question earlier uh, around kiwis and other, some of the other unusual varieties. Um, so uh, I would say for some of those kind of more unusual things, check out Fedco trees. Um, Indiana Berry Company has some of those things. They have elderberries, they have honeyberries and some of the more fun ones. Um, if you're, you know, there is another company like Stark Brothers is one that, you know, people tend to know. I don't really, I just haven't really had great experiences with Stark Brothers and I think they're kind of expensive. They do have a lot of varieties. Just be really cognizant of the, uh, the zones when you're dealing with these kind of national companies and make sure it's that 6A or 6B. Um, these ones towards the top, I, I guess another caveat here is if you're interested in purchasing fruit, you need to basically at this time of the year, many of the companies either are out of stuff or they stop selling. Like Fedco Trees, for instance, they uh, the end of February is when they, uh, they stop taking orders for their tree fruit and their perennial plants because they need time to get, the, get it ready to ship. They usually ship in April and then after that, it's it for the year. You, you can't really get that stuff mid season. So winter time ordering um, for, you know, by the end of February for spring planting. Um, but here's a, there's a few other references here. Grandpa's, Grandpa's Orchard is one of the places that we get our tree fruit from. Um, he's a great guy. I uh, would, you know, encourage you to check that out. But again, I'm not sure how much available if you haven't already ordered for this season, you might have to wait until um, next year if you're interested in that kind of stuff. Okay, a little bit of a breakdown in some of the uh, more unique plants. Um, elderberries are great. Uh, Tish, maybe this image will help you a little bit more um, to identify that plant because I, if it is poke, it is it, you know it does look a lot different, and especially you would know when it flowers out, but the berries do look similar. I, I can see these berries do look kind of like pokeberry. But in any case, um, this is a pretty tolerant plant. It's relatively low care and maintenance. Um, I'm growing them at the side of my house. Um, and, and that's between you know my house and my neighbor's house. So they actually are um, a deviant from what I said earlier in terms of needs of sunlight they can tolerate partial shade and they do pretty decently. Um, they, uh, you just wanna make sure that there's good drainage in the soil. Um, they do get pretty tall. Um, I know there was a question earlier about pruning. So essentially um, what we do with ours is, you know, you'll see that the, some of the branches will, uh, so they'll, they tend to, they, they, from the ground every year, they'll send up more branches from the ground. And that'll, 
it'll be green at first and then it'll get long and then it'll get more woody and rigid. Um, and then um, I honestly don't remember off the top of my head if they fruit on that branch on the on first year growth or second year growth, but you can over time maintenance is basically you can thin them out, um, especially like ours was getting super, super tall and we were, wanted to kind of keep it slightly more compact. And, and there are more compact varieties that you can choose, but the one that we have is tall. So you can go through and just selectively not removing more than 30% of the plant, um, just you know, cut some of those branches down aesthetically uh, to the ground, you know, making it look nice, having it fill out all of the kind of space of, of um, you know, of the, uh, having it kind of like spokes of a wheel if you were looking on, uh, 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 at the plant from the top. Um, pretty baseline, this is, you know, I essentially, I don't really do anything from, on this plant at home aside from pruning it a little bit and harvesting. I don't, I barely even, you know, feel the need to water. And, and most trees watering is after they're established, you know, Mother Nature helps a lot with our watering in Michigan. Like Mother Nature, in theory, covers about half of our watering needs um, during the growing season. That's not always true, but the you know we get decent rains through most of the growing season. You just might be might you know, especially in the first couple of years of its life, make sure you're watering on a regular basis once a week or once every couple of weeks. Give it a buck, a five gallon bucket of water, and um, And I think that's you know the baseline of what you need to do to care for this plant. Can you grow elderberry from a seed? Uh, you know, I've never tried. They tend to send up little babies around them. I think it's both with uh, they'll send up little runners. They'll send up like they'll send a little root out, and then it'll pop up, and so they'll produce reproduce that way. I suspect that you could. Um, you know, these fruit will have a seed in them. And I suspect I've never done it. I'm not sure. Sometimes seeds need like to be a, a cold period or need to be scratched or soaked or there are certain things. So I'm sure it can be done. I just don't have much experience with it. Um, so uh, I, I think a little bit of, you know, a little bit of research could, could get you there. And is um, elderberry a, a tree or a bush or both? It's tall, so in that way, it's kind of like a tree, but it's multi-stem, so it's kind of bush-like for that reason. This example, the, you know, this one here is, you know, pretty short, and I think there are some shorter varieties. Like I said, mine will get 12, 15 feet tall, and I kind of try and maintain that shorter by doing a little selective pruning. Um, so tall shrub. Uh, okay, Saskatoon, uh, this is, we were referencing this earlier, also called Juneberry or, um, uh, there's other names too. But essentially, um, I think I kind of gave the rundown on these earlier, but uh, this is what the fruit looks like. They are a distant cousin of apples. Um, they are relatively low maintenance and care as long as you got some good soil that they're growing in and you're considering uh, their light and water needs. Um, they can tolerate some shade. Um, they, uh, they, but you'll just get maybe less of a yield. And I definitely saw that in the ones that I was growing at home. That I wasn't, the ones I was growing between my house and my neighbor's house were, didn't have a ton of fruit, but when I moved them towards the backyard, which gets a lot more sunlight, it was a it was a much better scene. And here is pawpaws. This is one of my favorites. Um, it's a really fascinating tree. It looks tropical. Um, it is a distant cousin. I believe it's a distant cousin of mangoes, actually, um, and it looks very much like a mango. Um, but they actually are native to our region, believe it or not. Um, and uh, to describe the fruit, it's got this kind of custardy texture. Um, 
and uh, and the the sweet the sweetness. People make ice cream out of it. You they, people freeze it and then they put it through the blender and make ice cream out of it. Um, a really great treat. I think they're delicious. Um, they're really unique flavor. Um, they do take a minute to start to grow, get fruit. They take three to five years. Um, uh, but they're, they're a fun one. And, you know, if you're looking for something unique to try, I would definitely recommend it. I'm having a lot of success with growing them myself. Uh, a question was, do you guys have Saskatoon's available for sale this year? No, not this year. We'll probably bring them. We, we try and rotate some of the unique varieties. Like we, you know, one year we'll do Saskatoon, one year we'll do elderberry. So we try and switch it up every year. Um, yeah, I, I think in terms of where to source them, I know that uh, I was doing a little bit of research. I know that Fedco has them, though their sale is done for the season, but they're, you know, do a little research uh, and, uh, and I can follow up with you afterward if you are really, you know, or follow up with me if you want, you know, more detail on some of those sources. But um, so, when we're planting, uh, we're always, um, you know, generally speaking, we're trying to establish a new plant, giving them the entire season to, you know, but we're trying to plant a tree, giving them all of the growing season to start to get themselves established and prepare themselves to go through a cold season and have what they need. So that's why spring is definitely preferred. Whereas fall is, you know, though, you know, you can plant things in the fall or transplant things in the fall when it starts to cool off, the plants don't, you know, especially the trees don't necessarily have a whole lot of time to recover. Um, but if they're semi dormant at that point, you know, it might be okay. But just generally speaking, uh, spring is preferred. Containers are and uh, container grown plants, you know, have the soil around them. So transplanting is not as, as much a lot or, or bald and burlapped uh, is much or less of a concern. Okay, um, I'm going to summarize this. You can reference these slides a little bit later uh, or, you know, in the future when you're getting to this point. I do want to just say that um, being very intentional about setting yourself up for when you're going to plant fruit trees is highly recommended. So if you ordered trees through us or if you mail ordered them, um, you know, going out and test digging in the area that you want to plant the tree um, to make sure that you're not, you don't get any surprises, especially if you're on a vacant lot and there's, you know, a big concrete slab there or something, uh, which is not, has been known to occur. Um, so also having a sense of the soil quality, um, you know, highly, highly recommend doing, having a soil test. Uh, if you haven't had one done on, on the growing area at your garden, uh, if you don't know, we do uh, do one free soil test uh, for any garden that's in the garden resource program uh, because we want you to be safe. So we can, part of that is testing for lead in the soil. But the, so the soil test will also give you, be an indicator for some of the nutrient needs. And we'll look, a lot, look at a, an example a little bit later. And the next step is basically we're digging a, a hole that's, um, you know, uh, about two to three feet wide and about two to three feet deep. And how you want to go about doing that is first take the grass off the top, set that aside. Then dig the soil, you know, that basically we want to take this topsoil and make a second pile. So take the topsoil and you'll know that you're getting to the subsoil when the color changes or there's a differentiation. And also subsoil or the, the stuff that's below the topsoil will tend to, in some cases, tend to be uh, kind of smell bad, like it'll, it'll uh, smell um, anaerobic or slightly sour. Um, so you'll know like that the, it, it'll be, and it generally tends to be lighter in color. So when, if you hit that level, then start a third pile, 
um, and, and then dig that so out till you've got your, your depth. And part of that is referencing the, the depth of the root system that you're working with. So you wanna give roughly six inches, like when we're looking at, looking at this root ball in this situation, we wanna have you know, about six inches of open area around where those roots are gonna live. Um, and then you're gonna incorporate compost in with the topsoil, you know, take a five gallon buckets worth of compost and mix that in. Um, and also there, I also would recommend some, you know, based on what you see on your soil test, or there are a few uh, fertilizer recommendations, always, you know, we always recommend using organic fertilizers, but there's some granular ones that might be a good fit um, to incorporate that into that soil again. And then you're having somebody hold it in place for you, like, like this guy here. So this guy's holding the tree and then somebody else is, is pushing the soil back into the ground and, and in and around the plant. And then you take the handle of the, uh, the shovel and you're kind of loosely poking out any air pockets. You don't want it, the roots to dry out and then um, ultimately covering all the soil and then watering it really, really well. So you're trying to push the air out with the water and also really saturate that soil to, to um, take good care of those roots. Uh, this is just another image related to that graft union I was talking about earlier. So we definitely do not want that uh, graft or bud union to be below the soil surface. Um, another kind of reference on tree planting. Here's what happens if you plant too deep. Um, you could have problems with the, the top graft rooting and sending up shoots. And um, it's just going to kind of complicate the development of the plant. Okay, fertility. Um, fruit, you know, they make, they take a lot out of the soil to make those delicious apples and pears and peaches and plums. Uh, so we need to um, consider on an annual basis, replenishing the nutrients in the soil. Um, they all kind of if you're familiar with, you know, the standards, um, you know, uh, nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium are the are kind of the NPK are what you usually see on a fertilizer bag. If it's there's three numbers, it's usually those three numbers. Uh, but there's three other, you know, there's six essentially mac macronutrients that we want to make sure that we are paying attention to. And part of that uh, is having that baseline soil test. And here's an example of that. And then, um, and then you know, from year to year, you would be uh, you know, continuing to add uh, a little bit of top dressing of, of different types of fertilizer for, for these purposes. So referencing this soil test, um, if you look here, uh, so let's start with phosphorus on the left here which is P as a short, shortened version of that. Um, and then there's a column that says what the soil test result was. And then the next column is the optimal range. Okay, so in phosphorus, in this case, the optimal range is four to 14. And what, we, what the test showed is it's about 7.8. So it's right in the middle there. So that's totally reasonable. We're in good, um, in good standing on that, on that one. And then kind of clicking down the list here, um, potassium is there's, it's 62 and we really want the optimal range to be 100 to 160. So we might wanna do something to amend the soil for potassium. Um, and then if you look at the bottom here, there's another, this is like basically for some of those macronutrients, um, this is a, a basically a chart that makes a, makes it real easy for you to know that where you should adjust. Okay, so uh, we everything, calcium, magnesium looks you know pretty reasonable. So in this case, we, we might wanna add potassium. Um, so um, how to fertilize and how much to add um, is takes a little bit, uh, it's slightly complicated uh, and in that, um, you should have a baseline understanding of, 
of what the soil has before you just start throwing uh, fertilizer on the ground. Um, definitely um, avoid things that are uh, uh, like lime. Lime is not really, you know, is is really uh, um, uh, really adding uh, uh, base to the soil. Uh, so definitely, you know, want to be careful with that. Um, so uh, in the case, uh, there's, you know, if you're looking for organic fertilizers, there's uh, a, a lot of resources out there. Um, a lot of the hardware stores are starting to carry organically based fertilizers. Um, and so you want to, you know, have, there's a, a few things that would be, you know, not a big deal to put them down because they're slow release and they don't have high content. So if it's like a five, 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 that's five nitrogen, five potassium, five phosphorus. Um, you, you really want, you want to avoid something. You want more the ones that are um, lower on the nitrogen and higher of, of the other two. Um, just as a, as a, as a frame reference. Um, so uh, I think that gives you, you know, without digging too deep into, you know, you know, fertilizing is, is a big topic. So I'm not going to dig too deep into it, but there are some great reference books, including the Backyard Orchardist and the Backyard Berry Book. Um, and then locally, uh, and there's uh, Uncle Luke's in Troy, is they, they carry a lot of organic fertilizer. Um, and the guys that work there also would be a good per people if you were looking at a particular situation and you're looking for what kind of product to buy, they would be able to help you out. Um, so we got a couple questions. Uh, is most of the soil in Detroit heavy clay? And then... No, not necessarily. And then the other one was, do blueberries mine poorly drained soil? Uh, I don't remember. Wasn't on this one. Well, we, I wouldn't recommend trying to grow, grow blueberries here anyways, like I said, but, um, uh, I know that like blueberry, uh, yeah, I don't, I don't have a good answer to that question. Um, I would say they tend to grow on boggy soils or like uh, um, uh, muck, the, what's called muck soils, which what used to be a bog, uh, which are highly acidic. So I would say maybe they have some tolerance for water, but like as a general rule, most plants don't like their feet to be wet all the time. Uh, that, you know, I think that is- Go back to I the cartoon of the planning again. Um, yeah, uh-huh. Anything else? Um, go back to the cartoon. The cartoon? This one? Uh, I believe so. I think they just wanted to see it again. Okay. Again, we'll, oh, I'll be sharing these slides afterwards so you can reference the images you know, in the future. Um, so this is just a note that you, you know, to, to take fertilizing seriously and, uh, figure out a routine that works for you. Um, and, and just be careful not to put down too much, which could, uh, especially if it's got a lot of nitrogen in it, you're going to stimulate a lot of, uh, vegetative growth, uh, which can, you know, pose problems for the plant later in life. Um, I'm going to keep moving here because I'm running, you know, I'm already, I got still got some ground to cover and uh, I think there's more important things to present to talk about a little bit later in the slides. Um, this, I just wanted to share, we, we did a whole presentation on pruning trees. It is something that you should do on an annual basis. I would just recommend that you uh, check out the video on our YouTube channel. If you're, if you didn't check it out and you I also would, you know, I could share the slides with you. 
uh, if you, and I'll share my email at the end if you'd like. Um, definitely, definitely, definitely always uh, keep on top of weeds in the root zone of the plants, okay? So we want to make sure that we don't want grass to be growing right up to the base of a tree, and we don't want weeds to grow right up to the base of the tree. We want the zone where the basically where the root ball was planted that two to three feet when the plant was established, we always want to wood chip that or mulch that. And then as the tree gets bigger, we want to mulch the what we call the drip line. So basically, if my branches are out to here, I want the wood chips to be out to drip out to the length of my uh, where my the ends of my branches are. Um, so I always want to have basically because what we're saying there is as the branches grow out, also do the roots and, um, and some of them being very close to the top of the soil. And uh, if there's any comp and grass, you know, it tends to just occupy and most of the weeds just tend to occupy the first couple inches of the soil. Um, and that's gonna be, uh, uh, that's gonna be a competition for the roots of the plants or the trees. Um, lawnmower disease, if you're not aware, is where the, you know, you hire, you ask your buddy or your neighbor to come through and weed whip around your trees and he weed whips the bark of the tree and it girdles the tree and it dies. Um, so that's why we're trying to, another reason to mulch, because then he won't have to come up close to the base of the tree, um, to when he's doing his mowing for you. Um, okay. All right, insect pests. Okay, I'll start with um, kind of how I was talking about earlier is uh, it, I'm talking about wildlife in that conversation about, um, you know, the, about the squirrels and the deer and such is basically we are working with nature here. We're trying to work with nature, not against nature. Um, because if you try and work against nature, we probably won't win. Um, so pests are on, on some level are a fact of life. Um, and so what we're trying to do is manage as best as possible. And there are some strategies to do that. So basically, um, there's no blanket thing. There's no silver bullet. There's no thing that you just do every year. And that's going to keep the pests in check. Um, so it's really establishing the plants um, and monitoring the plants and getting to know them and their needs, and then uh, and in and looking for damage and then dealing with that in signs of damage and then dealing with that um, as it comes. Um, low number, you know, and then you know, in that within that. Uh, identifying and understanding the low numbers of pests uh, or in that, in that, I'm sorry, that you can, we can tolerate a little bit of pest pressure. Um, and then uh, ultimately, you know, when there's a certain threshold, we might need to start to think about, you know, the treatment options. Um, in some cases, we need to understand um, how to treat the cause of the pest. Um, so, uh, instead of the symptoms and, and so what I mean by that is a baseline for healthy garden in general, not only trees, but, uh, any plant is a healthy plant is much more able to, um, take care of itself and uh, resist pest problems than one that is struggling because it's not got good access to sunlight good nutrient accessibility and good access to uh, water. Um, and then finally, um, we, you know, in some situations, um, you, you may consider like some kind of insecticide. There are organic insecticides that are out there, but, uh, you know, just be aware of whatever you're using. Um, and oftentimes when you're using any kind of insecticide, whether it be organic or otherwise, 
it will kill not only the insect that you are trying to get, but it'll kill some of the beneficial insects. Um, and that's a problem. You know, that's gonna ultimately, you know, maybe have a ripple effect on other parts of your garden and the natural ecosystem. Um, we can always enhance the environment of, for beneficial insects that might help with pests um, by having um, flowering plants always going in the garden and learning more about native plants and uh, benefit, beneficial insect habitat, um, uh, including lots of these flowers. And we have some resources on that, um, but that's just, a, just to give you some ideas. So basically having, you know, something always blooming, um, some kind of unmowed areas uh, or, um, or perennial flower gardens um, is gonna create a habitat for insects that may uh, prey on some of the pests that we're dealing with. You know, one way of thinking about it is if you create a situ, if you're creating a garden, you're trying to create a garden that has lots of different types of beneficial insects you know, it kind of creating an inviting, inviting, uh, an inviting environment for a diversity of animals and insects means that one, you know, one particular insect uh, or pest will not dominate. Um, and just a reminder that pesticides are not a substitute for for good gardening practices. That is yeah. Is there anything um, you can do to prevent, I'm going to say it wrong, <laughs> viburnum beetles from eating the plants? They ate Vi her. Viburnum beetles? Japanese beetles? I'm not, I'm not familiar with viburnum beetles. They ate her um, nana berry and black currants. Um, so what I, so I am by no means an expert in pest management. I basically, what I do is identify the pest. So you have a sense of what the pest is at this point. And then either uh, I have a few books that I'll reference or, um, you know, I'll do a little bit of research on the internet for dealing with that pest specifically. So that is the strategy is to Identify the pest, identify the problem, identify the, this also relates to diseases, is like, okay, there's spots on the leaves of my pear tree. And then I'll look up pear leaf spot. And then I'll look up pictures. Oh, that looks just like what I'm dealing with. And then you can, you know, start to look at the articles related to that and figure out specific strategies for dealing with that. Because there's, you know, there are a host of, of treatments and there are a lots of different pest, potential pest problems or disease problems with, the, with a lot of these plants. So, um, uh, so all that said is I would, now that you have a general sense of what that pest is, do a little bit of recon and you can probably figure out some treatment options. Um, I'm gonna go through these, uh, you know, there, there are uh, types of controls. So I just wanted, this is just, you know, it's some general things to think about. Um, so there's cultural controls, um, which is uh, in altering the environment in and around the plants to try and deal with pest pressures. Um, and here's, you know, some examples of that. There are mechanical controls. In some cases you could um, do sprays or uh, do specific pruning using nets. Kaolin clay is, uh, is basically just that. It's like clay that you dissolve in water and spray and it, co it coats the, the fruit. And that is a strategy um, for deterring some of the pests. Um, so there, these are some of the other uh, types of mechanical controls, hand picking, um, making uh, sticky traps. Um, there are setting up uh, biological controls like beneficial insects, um, trying to attract them like 
uh, with the habitats, like I was mentioning earlier. Um, also attracting um, natural predators like uh, bats and birds um, uh, and uh, in, you know again all of these things in any of one of these things you wouldn't necessarily do these unless you knew what the problem first is so it's always like identifying the problem or you know knowing what the options are to deal with the problem and then you have some strategies of what to do in that circumstance. And then there are, you know, uh, different types of sprays, chemicals. Not all, uh, you know, some of these are non-organic and some of them are organic, like, uh, you know, BT, spinosad, kaolin and clay are all organically certified. Um, dormant oils or neem oils, you know, again, you got to know what the pest is that you're dealing with before you use them, but there are some options out there. Um, so, uh, uh, so, and then, you know, just as a general, just some categorization of the types of pests that you might be dealing with, um, there are, uh, fruit feeding insects. So they're ones that attack the fruit itself. There are foliage or wood feeding insects. And so, you know, if there's damage on the leaves or on the branches. Um, and uh, so basically we're trying to strategize um, and identifying where the problem is and, and strategies to deal with it. Um, always, always, to reduce pest problems, again, to review, you know, consider the health of the plant and what is going to help it thrive. Uh, we talked about soil fertility uh, and soil uh, quality, water access, sunlight. Um, sanitation is basically if there is any kind of fruit drop or um, if there any if there is a particular some in some cases there is an infestation on one branch or one part of the plant, um, you could, you know, you could make a strategy just to remove that branch and then you would remove it from the scene. Um, so again, there's no magic bullet. It's just getting to know what the problems are. Um, and, you know, of the things that we're discussing today, you know, you can, uh, and I guess I don't want this to scare all this talk about pests and pest problems. I hope that's not scaring you away from growing these plants. Like there are, you know, you may come into situations where you have to deal with them, but it's not, um, in many cases, it's not dire straits. Like these plants, you know, have in many situations have thrived for in, in orchards and gardens across Michigan just fine for many, many years. Uh, with you know some you know relatively low uh, pest maintenance needs, but it's just something that you need to be aware of um, if you want to get to the end you know to get the end goal of that fruit. So uh, knowledge is power. Uh, for reference, if you're dealing with any kind of pests, uh, <coughs> these little flip guides and this common tree fruit pest are all really great books. Um, I think you can get the pocket guides from MSU. Um, and again, we'll be sharing the slides so you can come back to this if, uh, for the titles, um, but I'm sure you can find them on places like Amazon as well. Um, we talked about beneficial insects, so I'm not gonna dig much more into that. Um, And here's some, you know, there's some reference here on um, spray schedules for, or things that you would use, you know, in a particular situation um, based on what pests or disease that you were dealing with and some of the tools that you would be using, sprayers and so forth. Um, and just, you know, we, we don't want to get to having to, having to use pesticides, but uh, there's just, you know, um, so it's tricky. 
being 100% organic with pest control or just dealing with pests on tree fruit is tricky. Um, it, you know, it's not, it's not, uh, it's something that you have to time. And I, well, I guess that's a good thing to reference for here. Um, a lot of these things, you, you need to know what the problem is, but not only that, you have to know at what, what point in development is the fruit or is the plant. So like, if you know that you have apple scab, you're going to wait till there's, there's, uh, there's green tip. So the buds have a green tip, uh, before you put down you start using your copper spray or, um, you're going to wait till the petals or petal fall off of, uh, the immature fruit before you use pyrethrin. Um, so as a, you know, as a few examples. Um, again, you know, uh, diseases are, oh, well, not again, getting into talking about diseases a little bit. Uh, so there are basically diseases are ab, uh, show up as abnormal growth or development on a plant. So if you ever seen like cankers or um, like on peaches and plums, this is a common thing where you, there's like, it looks like a knurled, like uh, bumpy growth in the middle of a branch. So, you know, this skinny branch and then there's this kind of bumpy knurled growth. Um, and so there are, uh, based on which one that you're dealing with, um, you're kind of monitoring them and there are specific strategies for each. Um, unfortunately, you can't really, there's not a whole lot you can do to be preventative because you can't, you don't really know what that you got it until they start to show up. Um, but it's another reason to be monitoring your plants on a regular basis uh, to see, make sure to look at the leaves and see there's not spots or damage on the leaves looking for discoloration or rust or, or mildew on the leaves. And um, in some situations, it might not be much of a problem at all, um, but, you know, doing, okay, why is that, why is that, why do the leaves on this tree look a little bit mildewy? Oh, apple leaf, mil, mildew on apple leaves, what is that? Okay, now I know what I'm dealing with. Um, and then here are some more reference guides um, related to diseases uh, in tree fruit um, that are, are good for reference. Um, and then here are just uh, some images so you have a general sense of you know what some of these things look like. This is apple scab. Um, in some cases, there's varieties that are, you know have resistance to some of these diseases, like apple scab resistant varieties of apples are are, are listed here. Uh, Liberty is one I'm familiar with. Jonah Free. Uh, this is an image of fire blight, another disease problem. Brown rot on stone fruit. Uh, so controlling fruit diseases is always, uh, always, always is, you know, healthy plants are more resistant. Um, making sure that you do all the, you know, prepping is good. Um, and then, you know, again, monitoring, staying ahead of, of um, being on top of fertilizer and uh, keeping on top of the weed control. Um, and, you know, and considering, um, you know, organic treatments based on what you have, what you're dealing with. Okay, it, there are a few resources for, um, for organic uh, pest management, specific organic pest and disease management uh, for future reference, organic tree fruit growers, I'm sorry, organicfruitgrowers.org and groworganicapples.com. Okay, and I just blasted through a bunch of slides, so I'm going to give a second for some questions. How are we doing on questions, Jessica? Um, no more for the moment. Okay, cool. How's everybody doing? Okay.
Um, so, um, so I guess I want to give give some time to open it up for questions at this point, and maybe we'll spend some more time on some of these other things. So I have a question. I know we went over kind of how far to plant the trees from each other and stuff, but you know I have I have a lot. So I was thinking about putting maybe two um two on well I have like four lots, but two on each. Well, yeah, two trees per lot. Do you think that would be like? idea or can I try to get three on there? Well, if you, if you have, so to clarify about the set, because you're talking, you're thinking about the setbacks. Yeah. Okay. So if you own four contiguous lots, mm -hmm. you only have to be 15, 15 feet in from the neighboring properties. And then it's like, so you can fit more trees in that space, essentially. Okay. Um, so. Uh, the other thing, I, I only have, I only bought one pear tree. Uh-huh. And after doing this presentation, I see that I probably need another. Yeah. I mean, you okay. can always plant another one next year. It's not oh. going to be, you know what I mean? Like, it's going to take a few years for those treats to establish anyways. Um, okay. But yeah, I mean, as long as you're considering that the, the, the trees need to be, you know, some at least 15 feet apart, um, and then you're considering, you know, the buffers from the neighbors and the sidewalk, in, in theory. And I guess the other caveat is um, more than nine trees in an orchard uh, is a trigger for the city to need a special hearing for allowance. Um, so. <clears throat> you have a question. Is it too late to get small fruits and fruit trees from the K, you know, KGD? We, we, the store is live still, yes. Um, I know that some of the stuff is sold out, uh, but there are, I know, I'm pretty sure there's still some of the small stuff, the blackberries, um, there's grapes, there's actually rhubarb, uh, there's raspberries, There, I think there's some elderberries left. Um, so yes, it, and, um, I think you can kind of get it through our web. It's a separate website from our, you know, our home website. Uh, it's our KGD store. You could just look up Keep Growing Detroit store, or I believe the link is, you can link to it from our home website. Um, but the simplest way is just, you know, search Keep Growing Detroit store. Um, Okay, so why don't we give some folks an opportunity to come off mute if you want, uh, or open it up to questions or conversation. Um, what's on your mind related to fruit? Uh, and uh, let's let's have a little bit of a conversation. Hi, Keto. This is Tiffany. Hey. Did you say that the Detroit ordinance is? nine fruit trees or 10 fruit trees? If you have more than 10 fruit trees, then you need to um, get a permit or you could have some problems with the city. Because I thought it was 10. Uh, my memory says nine, but I could be wrong. Uh, but I, if, if that's what, are you, is that your scenario? Um. Yes, I'm gonna look it up just to, to be sure. Okay. Angela's asking, would you recommend growing elderberry in a plant bag? No, I would not. I would not recommend 
Um, generally speaking, if any, I would not recommend growing trees in in large pots or anything that's going to get big and tall, like an elderberry wood, um, in any kind of container, because they really. It, it's it, it's because it's in a way it's creating more work for yourself because um uh because the the plant you know sends out roots into the ground that helps it access more water on a regular basis it also protects the plant um from freezing you know deep freezing temperatures during the winter the buffer of the soil around the roots um, and the um, the natural warmth that comes from this, you know, deep from the soil uh, buffers that. And so, if any kind of container you are removing the plant from that, you know, that environment in such a way that you're going to have to water much more often. Like anything grown in containers, you're going to have to water instead of once or twice a week, more like every day or every couple, every other day. Um, you know, because also you're, and you're growing in containers, you're trying to use soilless mixes, uh, because it, otherwise the soil is going to get too compacted and cause problems for the plant. And they just, you know, tend to dry out quickly. Um, so I, I just generally would not recommend using any of those, you know, containers, maybe for annual plants or some of the berries, maybe, but you're going to, have a lot more success if you're growing stuff in ground. Ashaki, you've been doing all the links. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. You know, how um, soon do you get a soil test results back? Uh, we, I think we just started sending out soil tests for the beginning of the year here, and they usually take two to three weeks and as long as a month. Um, it just depends on where the seed, like, it just kind of depends on how, how backed up the lab is. Wow. Um, if you're interested in, uh, Romando is, is our, you know, main soil test guy, and he's much more in tune with like where, where the lab is at and how quick the turnaround is, but generally speaking, you know, at least two to three weeks. I know we had got them done on the, I guess, front lots, but we got the back lots that I don't, I'm not sure. I don't think we got the soil test done on those lots. So, okay. I want to do it to make sure. Uh, so, there's a question here is this as the soil test, the free soil test for KGD members uh, only? Yes. You need, need to be a garden resource program member. Um, but I would say, I think we, if you want to use the same company that we use, uh, it's, I believe it's Dairyland Labs. Uh, and uh, it's pretty simple, you know, to do where you're, um, I think you you send you uh, they send you a, a you like say you want a soil you pay for a soil test they send you the packaging uh, and then and then you 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 put your soil test together and send it back to them. Um, so if if you're not able to be a KGD member um, because you're outside the city or something and you want more details on that, I'm sure we can help you out. You can drop me an email. I'm gonna drop me an email and I can help you with that or whatever. Um, and I'll put my email in the chat. Oh, Lisa, I wish we could give you a coupon code, but no, alas, not this time. But I, I will consider that uh, trying to build that in for next time. Um, uh at this point in the game um it's not really an option to do that but um i think that's a really really reasonable request i definitely want to encourage people to come to classes and um maybe we'll do that for the future okay well thanks for being with me today um and and checking out the information 
Um, I know it's a lot to take in. Uh, again, I will, uh, I'm gonna, I'll be uploading this video to our YouTube channel uh, in the, uh, probably sometime next week, early next week. Um, and I'll also share all these slides with you for future reference. Um, you know, definitely highly recommend, you know, some of the books like uh, The Backyard Orchardist, The Backyard Berry Book, um, The Apple Grower is another great book. Um, okay. Well, if we didn't have any last minute questions, we'll wrap it up for the, for the evening. And I have a question, Tito. Yeah. Yeah. I was wondering, are the greenhouses still available? Are the greenhouses still available? Mm -hmm. Can you tell me what you're, what, what are you referring to? Um, remember we had a conversation earlier in the year. Um, you were putting up a greenhouse at the Oakland Avenue farm. Uh huh. And I asked you about, you know, if there were any available and you said you'd get back with me. Yes. Um, there is, so that there is a program for, um, for people who it's mostly focused on folks who are farming. Um, and I did, and uh, forgive me, I did not forget about you. We have not had that meeting yet. I, really, okay. I'm just, um, it's a program that we, um, that is through the National Resources Conservation Service, NRCS. Mm -hmm. And we are waiting for them. Like, I'm just, they basically said, like, we're not ready for that, you know, for more people that apply for that kind of stuff at this point. Um, okay. So I still have your information if we did talk about that and I will follow up. Okay. Um, don't ever hesitate to drop me an email and say, hey, what's going on? Um, sure. But but that's the current status. Okay. And I would still need a soil test uh, done, I guess. Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. All right. Hi, Thank Keto. You. Oh. Hey, Georgia. Hey, Keto. I have a question. Uh, thanks so much. This was very informative. Um, well, I have two questions about a tree, a tree that we, we bought a tree, a pear tree from you guys, and it was really growing. It was flourishing, but somebody ran into it and knocked it down. I tried to save it. It split it. Uh -huh. it, it couldn't be saved. Um, okay. Just for future references, and hopefully we don't have people running on our lot again anymore. We, bear, you know, barred it off like that, but um. With our new community uh, lots that we're building, how many um, trees like Saskatoon? Because I looked it up to order some Saskatoon. Do you think eight would be too many? I was thinking like put two in each side, kind of as the four corners, because they're short, right? They don't really grow that tall. It takes like what ten years for them to grow twenty feet. Uh, I don't know if they're going to get up to 20 feet, but, um, depends on the variety. I, um, I don't, can you tell me more about your site? Cause it's been a minute. Um, uh, so not the site, not either. Well, two lots, two contiguous lots. We just got uh -huh. these, and these what? are new, these are newer lots. Um, the and other what? one, we have three all together on okay. one spot. And what else is on those lots? Nothing. It's bare. It's blocked. It's just, it's, okay. it's and yeah. How, but how about what, what do you have planned for those lots? What else do you want to be? Um, I have, well, I have the whole plot, the, the plot, the plan has been approved uh, by the land bank when we bought them from them. Uh -huh. So it's, but I had, I put in space for trees, you know, small trees rather, but it's going to be, uh, benches, a storytelling area is going to be um, mostly perennials. The whole outside border line is lined with, going to be lined with perennials, uh, okay. particularly hostas. We've already uh -huh. pre-bought some hostas um, 
So, you know, they'll come back and they'll continue to grow larger to serve as kind of, of, of a barrier from the easement. Um, and then there are, there's pathways. So there's gonna be educational pathways, a butterfly garden and okay. um, yeah, like that. So it's, I mean, the, uh, I guess I would just consider the mature size. Okay. Um, generally, I would encourage growing likes with likes. So growing them kind of in a, you know, uh, spacing, I think their spacing recommendation for Saskatoon's is maybe six feet. I can't remember off the top of my head, honestly, but, um, okay. but anyways, consider the spacing and plant them in a, in all in one area is what I would, I guess I would encourage. Okay. Gotcha. Maybe just along the back of it. Of right. Or cover. in a block, you know, in like, you know, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, you know, like in two rows or three rows. Or oh, something. okay. Okay. I got so you. There's I like, got you you know, two and three in a row and there's three rows or whatever. Okay, I got you, I hear you, okay. So they may be, they may, may be better for the other garden than at the edge, okay. And last question, I mean, when is this? Them, I mean, I, you know, you could do them in a row. Like, I think it sounds like you have an open palette there, so. Um, it is an open palette. It's really a, a good open space right. to work with. Right, so, you know, um, yeah. I, okay. That, yeah. So what's as soon as I can get those hostas in there, you think? Please. I know that's not about trees, but you well, I don't um as soon as the soil is workable. Okay. Yeah. All right. Karen. All right. Okay, I'm gonna go to the next Thank question. Thank you. Yep. Hey Karen, how are you? Hey, I'm doing fine. How are you doing? Good. Um, well, you know, we originally um, over in Eden Gardens planted our trees. They're, I, I, you know, they're kind of close together. Um, uh -huh. How's that going to affect the growing? Because, you know, it's been like seven or eight years now. And um, how close are they? Um, I think about four feet apart. If... How big are the trees now? Um, well, they're taller than me, so I guess to say they're getting close to, close to about 5'11", five, 5'6 five, feet. They're growing and producing fruit, but they're not producing a lot of fruit because they keep getting them little, that little orange, some kind of infection on it. But uh -huh. the, um, the um, um, you know, I originally did it with Keep Growing Detroit and then later found out they're, you know, too close together and close yeah. to the sidewalks i'm kind of wondering how this is going to affect it you yeah. know as you're growing unfortunately there's not a whole lot you can do i don't think you can if they've been there that long i don't know i mean so your options are um it's been a long time and you might be risking them so just kind of ride the wave and try and do what else you can to um, stimulate growth and health of the plants. Mm -hmm. um, or you could cut your losses and cut one of them down and plant another one at the correct distance. Okay. I mean, if they're that old, it sounds like they're maybe a little bit stunted because they probably would be a little bit bigger by now. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so yeah, but like trying to, I mean, you can try and move them, but like you're just risking them maybe, maybe, maybe making it, maybe not. Yeah, because the, tr the trunk is getting thicker, right? but they're not really growing, you know, when I, the cherry trees are good, doing pretty, really good, but the apple and pear, I think we get a little small pear. We don't really get a lot of food on the trees either. Okay. Um, yeah. Well, just, yes, just, just go with it, huh? I would, well, I mean, you have, 
it's either uh, try and bolster them or if you're unhappy with how they are, yeah, I mean, you got, you're risking, you're either keeping them, the keeping them and like seeing what happens. And even though they're really close together, just trying to make the best of it. Um, and they're going to probably, you know, if they get to mature size then their branches are going to maybe grow into each other or, yeah. or you're trying to transplant it or you're just cutting your losses and cutting one of them down. Okay. Well, one of the children broke one down and grew and it's growing back. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh -huh. Okay. We'll All righty. All right. Uh, any other last questions before we? Yeah. Yeah. Up? Keto, this is Tish again. Um, I just looked at the uh, online store at the Elderberry uh -huh. and I noticed that they're sold in a bundle. Is right. it necessary to have two of them? For those varieties, yes, that's why we did it that way. They need a cross, those two particular varieties. Okay, and it takes them three years before they will show any sign of a, um, a fruit? It sounds about right, based on my own experience, yes. Okay, and both of them will flower, or both of them will get fruit, or just one? Both of them, yes. Okay. Cool. Um, all right. Anybody else? Okay. Very good. Um, it was it was good to be with you guys, and uh, hopefully we'll see you at the next one. Um, okay. Very good. Thanks a lot, Jess. I pre I really appreciate it. I really appreciate oh, you're welcome. It. Okay. Um, okay. Oh. We'll, yeah. I'm sorry. One last question, real yeah. quick. Uh huh. I I pick up my trees on the 14th. Uh huh. How long before I have to put them in the ground? That weekend. I, I was mean. okay. I was uh, um. I'm gonna have some kids come out on Saturday and help me dig the holes. So yeah, I get them in. But I was just making sure that. Yeah, that we're really encouraging yeah. people to get them in the ground. Yeah. Okay. Yep. Okay. All right. Thank you, Tito. Have a good night. You too. Good night. Good night, everybody.